In May 2000, a British Special Forces unit infiltrated a village in regional Sierra Leone. The village was right on the edge of enemy territory and the operators were expecting a fight. What they weren't expecting, however, was to find a platoon of Nigerian soldiers holed up there. With orders to defend the village and wait for reinforcements, the men had held their positions for months without resupply. Only days after the British arrival, these men were outnumbered and fighting to the death against a battalion of gangster rap fanatics. This is the fascinating story behind one of the strangest battles in modern military history. In 1991, a rebel group composed of largely disgruntled young men arose in Sierra Leone's countryside. Fed up with the established elites in the capital, Freetown, hoarding the nation's vast diamond wealth, they began a populist campaign. Named the Revolutionary United Front, the group wasn't affiliated with left or right wing politics, nor with any ethnicity or religion. Their goal, as stated by their leader, Fode Sanko, was no more slaves, no more masters, power and wealth to the people. Great in principle, but once Sanko controlled the diamond mines, he decided to keep the wealth for himself. Sierra Leone's economy promptly collapsed. To protect his newfound wealth and combat government forces, Sanko armed the RUF with weapons imported from allied rebel groups in neighboring Liberia. The RUF also began a terror campaign across the country, forcibly recruiting child soldiers and killing people indiscriminately. Infamously, they cut the hands, arms and legs from nearly 200,000 Sierra Leonean civilians. They rationalized that amputees could not mine diamonds to support the government. After this had been going on for eight years, the United Nations got its paperwork sorted out and decided to launch a peacekeeping mission. The United Nations mission in Sierra Leone, known as UNAMSIL, deployed in 1999 to enforce peace via violence. A large contingent of the soldiers fighting in UNAMSIL were seconded from the Nigerian army. Seen as tough, no-nonsense fighters, the Nigerians were welcomed by Sierra Leone civilians. By July, the UN had brought the RUF to the negotiating table. They agreed to end the civil war and to bring back democracy. But once the UN backed off, the RUF started fighting again. In May 2000, the rebels blocked the road between Freetown and the airport, effectively besieging the city. Hundreds of foreign aid workers and civilians were trapped and at the mercy of the RUF. That's when the British got involved. British and Indian Special Forces led the charge into Sierra Leone. They first secured the airport, called Lungay, and began evacuating UNAMSU personnel. Across the country, SAS operators and elite Gurkha troops from the Indian Army conducted hostage rescue operations and surgical strikes against RUF forces. This effectively splintered the more disparate parts of the RUF into separate factions. One of these splinter groups was the West Side Boys. Mostly comprising former child soldiers and led by an ex-army corporal that promoted himself to brigadier, the West Side Boys were obsessed with American gangster rap culture and renowned for their extreme cruelty. On May 10th, the Pathfinder platoon of one para, which is essentially the British paratroop regiment's elite force, was deployed to the village of Lungay Lol. This settlement was an isolated pocket of civilization in the jungle and lay directly between a group of 600 Westside boys and the airport. It was here, in Lungai Lol, that the Pathfinders ran into the forgotten platoon. The Pathfinders arrived by Chinook, rapidly deploying from two aircraft and fanning out to secure the village. Intelligence on rebel movements was scarce and they expected to be shot at as soon as they arrived at the landing zone. Eyes watched them from the trackless jungle but no shots were fired. Within minutes, the Brits secured the village's perimeter and their Chinooks flew away. The men were on high alert, expecting an attack at any moment. Suddenly, a man appeared from a low hut. The man was tall and dressed in an immaculate green uniform. His boots were polished to a high shine and his shirt was pressed and starched to a tee. 
freshly shaven and sporting a pair of enormous shiny aviators as well as a light blue UN beret, the man strolled casually over to where the pathfinders were digging in. Sergeant Heaney remembered vividly what happened next. In an upper class British accent, the man politely said, Good afternoon gentlemen, I'm Lieutenant Oronto Obasanjo from the Nigerian army, forming up part of UNAMSIL, the United Nations peacekeeping mission here in Sierra Leone. You are most welcome. You are from which nation's military? Her Majesty's Armed Forces, if I'm not mistaken. Recovering from the immediate shock of such a friendly reception, Hini handed Obasanjo over to his commander, Captain Harris. Mission oriented and still on alert, Harris first got Obasanjo to brief him on Langai Lol's geography, contact with the enemy, and about everything else a ground commander might want to know. Only later, once the trenches had been dug and the pathfinders could see no attack was coming immediately, did Harris get Obasanjo's full story. Obasanjo and his 16-man platoon had been deployed to Langalol six months before as part of the first wave of Yunamsu soldiers. Since then, they had received no orders, no food supplies, no ammunition, no communication, and had not seen a single person from outside the village. In return for their security presence, the Langalol villagers fed and housed the men. However, most had, quote, gone native. Heaney later recalled that the Nigerian platoon had basically been left marooned for six months, so at some point during that time, the guys themselves had got out of their uniform, put local gear on, married local girls, and were now part of the village. The soldiers believed that they had been abandoned by the UN and had begun new lives as Lungalol villagers. They wore sarongs like the locals and didn't carry weapons anymore. Only Oban Sanjo had faith that eventually the UN would come to relieve them. He maintained his uniform as well as he could and kept his weapon and equipment as clean as possible. It's hard to imagine how he would have felt when Harris told him the Pathfinders weren't his relief force. They were there to take the fight to the enemy. The West Side Boys knew British soldiers protected Lungai Lol, but they had seen only two helicopters fly in, informing them that the defending force was small. Believing their superior numbers and heavy weaponry would prove decisive, the West Side Boys decided to attack. They named their mission Operation Kill British, and their battle plan was equally creative. At around 0445 on the morning of May 17th, the West Side Boys Vanguard approached Lungai Lol. In the early morning darkness, one of the rebels let loose a battle cry and advanced on the village. Behind him was a column of 30 to 40 West Side Boys, all armed with AK 47s. The men at the front fired a single shot from the hip, but his rifle immediately jammed. Stopping to clear it, Neither he nor the men behind him realized they were all in a kill zone. The Pathfinders and Nigerians had spent a full week preparing Lungai Lol's defenses. An influx of villagers displaced from other settlements by the West Side Boys provided a steady stream of intelligence and the defenders knew exactly where the attack would come from. The Brits set up a forward trench backed up by three support trenches to the rear. They planned to bear the brunt of the attack while Obasanjo's forgotten platoon covered the flanks. To back them up, the Pathfinders had two mortar pits in the village with 51mm mortars. When the West Side Boys leader stopped to clear his jam, three machine guns opened fire on him and his men. They were nearly all cut down. After their frontal assault failed, the West Side Boys flipped to page 2 of the World War I battle manual and started a heavy bombardment. For over an hour, they battered the defenses with rockets, mortar shells and heavy weapons fire. Over the din, Obasanjo could be heard shouting encouragement to his men. All held their positions while the Pathfinder mortars did their deadly work. Firing illumination rounds and high explosives alternately, the mortars kept the battlefield lit up enough for the trench machine gunners and riflemen to hold the West Side Boys back. Several times they launched frontal assaults, but the defenders' withering fire kept forcing them back. After sunrise, the attack waned. The West Side Boys kept up sporadic fire into the defenses, but eventually pulled back, broken. They took some of their dead with them, but left at least 25 bodies on the battlefield. One villager had been hit by a ricochet, and the Pathfinder's medic tended to her wounds. There were no other friendly casualties. The defense at Lungai Lol had a cascading effect on the war in Sierra Leone. The West Side Boys broke up and joined other rebel groups, telling stories of the British Pathfinders and the forgotten Nigerian platoon. Morale across the RUF began to collapse, and the rebels began infighting. 
Within a few months, this infighting had destroyed the RUF's organization and they no longer posed a significant threat to Sierra Leone. After 16 days in Lungai Lol, the Pathfinders left the same way they'd arrived. Back at the base in Freetown, they reported the village's situation to the UN officials. The UN officers had no idea there were Nigerian peacekeepers in the area and had stopped paying Lieutenant Obasanjo and his platoon months ago. But while the Brits left, Obasanjo remained. Still carrying out his order, he stayed with his forgotten platoon, keeping watch over the village of Lungai Lol. That was the incredible story of how a British Special Forces unit teamed up with some peacekeepers the UN forgot about to fight off a mob of gangster rap fanatics. But what do you think? Had you heard of the brutal RUF and Sierra Leone civil war? How could the UN just forget about a whole platoon of peacekeepers? Do you think Lieutenant Obasanjo and his men are still there? It seems like they might be. Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.